All right, I'd like to um, call this meeting of the five-year plan committee meeting to order. And um, just because, you know, we haven't seen each other in a while, it'd be great for people to go around and just introduce themselves to start off. Um, I'm Meredith Cole. I'm a trustee of the library. Susan? <laughs> I'm Susan Huffman. I'm the branch manager at Nelson Memorial. Alita Childs, and I'm a trustee, Nelson. David Plunkett, I'm the director of JMRL. Uh, I'm Pearl Hartwell. I'm president of the board of the Friends of JMRL. Krista Farrell, I'm the central library branch manager and assistant library director. Uh, Kayla Payne, I'm the collections and technology manager. Meredith Dickens, I'm the collection manager. Haley Tompkins, I'm the Crozet branch manager. And Tony Townsend, I'm the uh, Album World trustee and president of the JMRL board this week. Right. I guess I should have said I was a Charlottesville representative. Thank you guys for reminding me. Um, so I think our first order of business was to go over the current strategic plan. Did you want to take it away, David? Sure. Uh, so I shared a draft with you all this morning, and I just finished going through and doing an exercise that those of you who were in this group last year, we did, we kind of um, color coded it a little bit. So the uh, yellow that's in there is uh, is an ongoing goal, green is an accomplished goal, and red is we're no longer pursuing that goal. So we can go through that briefly. Uh, so we do that annually as part of a strategic planning. Um, but now this group's job is to come up with a new strategic plan for the full board to vote on in June of 2024. So we're looking at where we are in the current plan and making sure that we're on track for the things that need to happen. But we're also kind of keeping our eye on the future, which is the next agenda item. So I, I made another doc that was kind of a brainstorming doc. And I had thought we would try to steal some of the ideas that didn't get accomplished that we think we need more time on and, and move them over into the new doc. Kayla, you were kind of breaking up there too a little bit. Oh, the video? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll stop clicking around. I think that's what does it. It's, it's going on. Anyway, I, I'll share. Um, so all of you should have access now to a new folder uh, that is called something it is called five-year plan 2025 through 2029. Um, so uh, trustees, you'll need to be logged into your uh, JMRL email in order to get access. Prol, I think you should just be able to click into it, but let me know if you have any technical problems there. Um, and the current plan, everybody's already in it. You guys are way ahead of me. The current, uh, the, the successful strategy that we have used for the last um, three plans, I believe at least, has been to uh, use these same six goals, a goal of access and outreach, a goal of technology, staffing, collection, finance, and facilities. So we, we're not married to that, you know, we could, we could change that if need be, um, but that's kind of has worked well to kind of focus our, our work here. And a lot of goals. Uh, there were for goal one, I mean, a lot of objectives, 15 objectives going into, uh, you know, from the old plan. So uh, I don't, I don't want to read everything to you all, but let's at least touch on each of them. Um, and hopefully it won't take an hour to do that. <laughs> but uh, goals one, two, and three, uh, the first one is the library board will compare service measures to those of state and national libraries. Metrics to be compared include circulation, programming, and funding. I think this is really something that staff can do for the board and present on. So uh, it has yet to be done, but it's not a major thing. Biblio Commons is the tool that we enter the Bibliostat information in annually. Uh, the business office and Kayla and Meredith all work really hard on collecting all of our statistics about our services, and we have access to other peer library statistics. And the next one is programming staff uh, in conjunction with the programming committee will use output and outcome data to develop and sustain a range of accessible and representative programming. So um, a lot of goals and objectives for the last few years ran into a COVID wall right in the middle of this five-year plan. Uh, so our programming was 
largely on hold, sporadic, hybrid, different from what we were used to for a year or two. It is finally pretty much back to full scale programming with some tweaks that we've learned over the years about how to do that during COVID. But I, I'm not sure that we have a systematic response to this objective. The next one was about summer reading, summer feeding programs that we took part in. Uh, each, each branch had at least some sort of communication, some more than others. Louisa was actually a, a, a handoff site for a while. Uh, you know, I know that uh, in Charlottesville, it was more go to areas in which these feedings were happening and provide other programmings. Uh, I know Susan could speak about experiences in Nelson, but there has been no regional coordination on that. So all three of those are. TBD. Creating institutional cards for community partners. This is number four. Um, so this got looked at by the circulation committee and the customer service committee. Um, what ended up happening is that this turned into this idea for teacher cards. So rather than having institutional cards, we offered a greater range of access for teachers. So this one morphed a bit, but it's where it, this is where it started. That's where it ended. Objective five, we added flexible non-registration programming and early literacy story time at each location. That is done. This policy manual review is ongoing and has been ongoing for a while. We've got a good draft of what it should look like, but there's work to be done to make it happen. Policy committee is working on that. This public engagement strategy, this is um, a long time goal here that was supposed to be done in 21 and hasn't been, um, but it's basically codifying JMRL's public engagement strategy, as it says, uh, and exploring ways to educate new area residents about services. So hopefully we'll have output on that by the end of this year or next year. By the end of 22, evaluate extension services region-wide to assess the need for expansion. This was largely about the bookmobile uh, we worked with the Weldon Cooper Center to get some demographic information, GIS mapped with our card usage. And uh, I, I haven't shown that to the full board yet, but I think that would be a good CE, Tony, coming up. Um, it shows where there's a lack of card holders, basically, in our population centers especially, but also in areas without population centers. So uh, we have that data. Uh, we've been sharing it with Louisa County as we're working on them about expanding services in uh, bookmobile services in Louisa and we'll be working with Nelson County as well. Right now those both of those projects are in the budgetary stage so we'll see what gets funded for next year. 22 evaluate methods to provide workforce development. Um, so this largely was based on the success of the um, job fairs that uh, both Northside, Louisa had put on from time to time. The idea was to kind of take that model and move it around the region. And it kind of hit a hole uh, in the middle of COVID as well. Um, so we're still interested in this, but having that large in-person gathering hasn't quite rebounded. <clears throat> and the uh, equity committee is discussing a comprehensive policy and procedure review with the goal of removing barriers to library service. By the end of 23, develop a plan to enhance the role of JMRL in early literacy development, academic achievement, and promotion of lifelong learning, network with local, state, and national organizations to foster literacy. The most success we've had here is with Susan in Nelson County, um, which this dovetails into this objective 13 here, develop an institutional relationship with service area schools. So Susan's been able to do that, has an MOU with Nelson County schools that we're kind of treating as a pilot there. Susan, you want to talk about Kind of the early literacy night and any other any other thing that's related to 11 or 13 here sure um well we partnered with uh, both elementary schools reading specialist and last week we had a literacy night that we hosted here at the library the reading specialist did uh worked with the parents about skills that they could use to help their children and the library staff took care of the children um, extremely successful we did tie river on tuesday night which is the a southern elementary school we had 125 here and we did rockfish valley last thursday night we had 75 um as part of that we have extended ourselves into the school system we're doing um monthly uh story times with each of the grade levels in each school uh we're doing nelson reads uh we've been partnering with the high school and middle school to do more with them in their library setting uh, we're working on cards for all the children 
So um, we're going to be doing something special in April with the second grade about poetry and literacy. So lots of things going on there. So um, Susan's really run with both of these goals, but the idea was to do this everywhere. It's a bit harder because we have five different school systems and then private schools and things to work with. But uh, a lot of the what we're learning from what Susan's doing will be scalable. And those were sandwiched around number 12 by the end of 24, increased the number of active card users by 5% over fiscal year 20. So this did not happen. Uh, you know, we are down users since that time. I think, Kayla, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're around 95,000 now. Uh, I think we've lost about four or 5,000 overall card holders in that period. Does that sound about right? Yeah, I think we're at 97 now. Okay. Something okay. about that, but. Uh, but we're not over where we were in fiscal year 20. Of course, a little something happened right in the middle of that. Uh, but we're still looking to um, achieve this objective by uh, targeting community growth areas. So we're specifically like in Louisa County looking at the Zion's Crossroad area and Ophelia and Wendy and Catherine and I met last week. And we're going to go do some kind of same page programming um, library awareness events in that area that's it's kind of stuck halfway in between the Charlottesville libraries and the Louisa County libraries but there's a huge amount of growth there Louisa last week was named the third fastest growing county in the state so tons of families moving into that area that will be looking for services this doesn't have to be a monologue anybody feel free to jump in at any point <laughs> Uh, 14 is done, formalize a partnership with UVA to share library resources. So we have, we uh, started during the pandemic, a local interlibrary loan at no fee for NAJM or all card holders. That's an ongoing project now, although it kind of serves at the whims of the university library. Um, at any point, they could decide they're not getting much out of their end of it. So the only part of this that, um, that hasn't happened is the delivery of hold CVA libraries and offsite account creation. We're still talking with them about that. But right now, the, the general idea was that if you needed a book that's at the UVA library in Nelson, you could get it without a cost. It would just, you'd have to wait the time it takes to get it there. It'd be about a week or two. Branch managers here are aware of this goal. By the end of 24, each branch library will develop a neighborhood-specific community action plan to address the unique needs of their patrons. And this ties in with another one later about their facilities. So all managers are working on this. We have a, a shared doc with every branch where managers are putting in their ideas for their building needs and services. Uh, some of that, like, you know, Nelson doesn't need a new library. There's a brand new library there, but there are other kind of capital level things that could be discussed, such as an extension for a, a STEM classroom we had talked about at one point, backed off that a little bit, and now are more interested in um, providing access throughout the community by bringing in these 24-hour these, um, library kiosks. Okay, goal two, technology. So here's the biggest change. Those of you that were here last year. So everybody was here last year except for Haley. Is that right? Alita, were you on this committee last year? And Meredith? No, I, I, I did not start until July. Uh, okay, is that same for you, Meredith? I don't remember when you put me on the committee. I'm sorry. I think I've been to one other meeting. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so and now I'm in charge. So that's now you're in charge. <laughs> Thank you for taking up the taking up the mantle here, though. <laughs> so uh, briefly, I'll describe what happened here. This this only had one goal, which was to follow JMRL's technology plan, and then we had a lengthy technology plan as an appendix. Uh, the technology, the board technology committee was interested in establishing some high level board goals here, and then um, having staff having a staff document that would be here's here's what staff needs to do in order to meet those so so the original five-year plan that runs through 24 just had one goal here that says meet the technology plan then had a whole appendix which was a technology plan so uh kayla worked on this with the staff technology advisory committee brought it back to the full technology board and this revision was made last year i have to say i'll put in a plug now that i really i like the way that this ended up and I see this as a potential uh, blueprint for our next strategic plan for the whole library system. There's a lot of detail in this plan, which is great, uh, but it's a board level document in the end. It's the library board saying to the community and to the library staff, 
here are the things, here are the broad level things that we want to accomplish. So this is a bit more succinct than what we had in this current plan and a bit broader about here are the overall goals and allow some flexibility for how to get there. This is my plug for that. Okay, so Kayla and her team are working on improving IT infrastructure and raising cybersecurity awareness. We all get fished by Kayla every once in a while. We get an email that you're not supposed to click. You're supposed to press a button that says this is not real. Um, Kayla, I thought long and hard about that thing from Versa today. We got this email today from our insurer that says, update your iOS devices right now. Your Apple phones, iPods, iPads, things like that, because there's a security thing out there. And I thought, is this Kayla trying to trick me? Because this is really good. <laughs> but it wasn't. It's real. Update your iPhones. Uh, so this is an ongoing project. We're using a tool called Know Before, um, which a lot of other organizations use, including the city, to work on the cybersecurity end of this. By the end of next year, evaluate the current public computing setup, provide a formal recommendation for the future and total number of public PCs available. Uh, potential proposals could include desktop virtualization. I think we're backing away from that idea and instead looking at an idea to have these kind of mini, mini desktops that only require uh, a monitor and a keyboard. So you can keep the monitor and keyboard forever and just swap out the little mini desktops. Uh, Kayla's working on a pilot for that. Continue continuing uh, support, continuing education and staff training needs, uh, develop incorporating a virtual training platform with video storage. So we are now using a tool, we just got it and are working on it called Niche Academy for that. Uh, it'll, it'll both support staff training and then uh, eventually host our virtual programming as well for the public. IT department will support programming initiatives with library staff, including digitization, Augmented and virtual reality programs, assisting patron content creation with technology-driven services. So we're working on this. This is tied in, I think, um, at the main library with some changes uh, to the former Monticello Avenue Computer Lab, which we're going to re-envision yeah, as this digital media center that offers some of these to the public. Hopefully, though, we will also have some that are easily portable that either if a branch can't doesn't have space to house them, we'll be able to get them out to a library that wants to use them for a set amount of programming or a certain time. Number five here, explore improvements to branch facilities, phones and networking infrastructure, expand wireless, secure after hour holds lockers and book vending machines are some ideas to increase access. So. Uh, a lot of progress here, and we could call this done if it wasn't for this book vending machine. So um, Susan and Alita and I have high hopes that uh, next fiscal year will be the first rollout of one of those at a place to be determined in Nelson County, but probably in Nellie's Ford. <laughs> yeah. Determined, but likely in Nellie's Ford. Okay, um, and the last, see, these are broader goals that, that says, you know, like, here's what we want. We want to increase access, and here's some ways that we might do it, rather than saying you have to have a, a book uh, a vending machine there, because we know that that, you know, might, may or may not happen next year. High hopes, but maybe not. And the last tech goal is about uh, our digital presence, offering new technological services for the community, and this includes a complete website redesign. Um, making good progress here, got held up with the move of all of our resources to a brand new server. Uh, we're expecting completion last summer of migrating all data from both the classic catalog, uh, the, um, I'm sorry, the classic website, the Find It catalog, uh, the beta website, all of our in-house tools like our intranet and, and meeting room booking and things. Uh, just finished the last migration of that the other day where all the data is now on the new server. So finally at a point where um, something our digital services coordinator has been looking for for a long time, we'll have a true development environment for our website. So before that, it was kind of work on stuff and then post it live. But now there's a place that is a, like a staging center, basically, where we can begin to update things and then push them out into development, um, which is a very, you know, that's the norm and the standard for these things. It's just not something JMRA has been able to do until recently. Okay, staffing. Um, annually, JMRO will review compression needs and apply the county's algorithm to pay increases as funding allows. So the reason that this is deprecated, basically, like we're not moving forward with this, is that instead, uh, and there's a goal on this later, but instead, JMRO took part in the city of Charlottesville's pay study 
and the uh, focus is going to be on getting everybody up to whatever the results of that pay study say, which we know are going to say, you know, require more funding for most of our positions. So rather than try to use our current pay scale to address the compression there, we're going to, we're going to start over with, with, you know, whatever this study shows us and then work with our jurisdictions to fund that. Trustees will annually see continuing ed and networking opportunities, focusing on advocacy, advocacy for increased financial support, work with LVA and VLA. Uh, at the time, four years ago, we were talking about trying to get a conference together just for trustees. Uh, I remember vividly that Erica Younglove and Nan Carmack from the state and I were going to have a call about this on, uh, it was like March 15th, 2020. <laughs> and instead, I was meeting with the county, uh, Albemarle County's emergency services coordinator. Um, so I think the state has done a lot to help us with this. Uh, trustees, you might have seen today the trustee newsletter that the state puts out now. You know they have done a lot to kind of improve communication there, but it's been pretty one way. We haven't done too much. I think the idea here four years ago was that Jay Merrill is one of the largest public libraries in the state and clearly a leader in the field, and we want to we want to um, act that way when it comes to this issue uh, of advocacy. The next three are completed. Uh, crafting a customer service statement is done, forming a customer service committee, um, evaluating the needs for separate staff personnel manual, which ended up being an employee handbook is completed, and uh, assessing the current training needs and updating the staff training plan. All done. There are a lot of members here of this group that are also on the JMRL staff training committee, and they have worked very hard to get this done. So. Uh, assess the needs at branches for ad adding staffing to provide additional evening and weekend hours. So we haven't added any hours since uh, I think it was fiscal year 20 when we when we accomplished this goal at the bottom here, objective nine, um, 48 hours per week at Louisa and 60 hours at Northside. But we have had some conversations with amongst staff, with members of the public and with elected officials about additional hours. Frequently what comes up is the request for Sunday hours at some locations. Um, I know, you know, when Susan and I were talking about the new Nelson building, we were talking about potentially Sunday hours there, but then COVID happened. So we haven't seen the big push for these things. So I'm not quite sure if, if, if that's still a need in that area, but I do know Tony's aware that we've got folks from Albemarle County asking for more, for more Sunday hours. Don't tell Haley. Um, where were we? Number mm -hmm. seven, uh, develop systems to encourage innovation from staff. Uh, we're constantly working on this. I call it done because we've got some staff feedback that really is working well. We're getting input from staff and able to implement changes and uh, you know organizationally get things done. You know, yesterday at the manager's meeting, we were talking about a new receipt paper across JMRL that's gonna be BPA and BP, is it S free? Um, and that came from a staff suggestion there. Uh, but I, I think that this is not, I think we've met the letter of this goal, this objective, but there's still work to be done here. Um, so staff will continue working on that. The equity committee has been working on a diversity plan uh, that uh, is pretty much, I shouldn't say pretty much done, but uh, a lot of the work has gone into it. It needs revision and um, needs some editing down likely. Secure funding to add those hours to meet the former state standards. The state no longer has those standards. So that's done. Objective 10, um, perform a review of the pay scale. So as I mentioned, this objective uh, is still in play and kind of replaced objective number one there. We're expecting the results of that study any day now, and then it'll be up to uh, administration and then the board's budget committee to start figuring out how we're going to get that worked into future budgets. It's not going to make it into the fiscal year 24 budget. That budgeting is already in the hands of the jurisdictions. Um, develop and implement a staff cross-training plan. So this came from the training committee. Uh, Susan spearheaded this staff cross-training. We're in the first year of this. It's going swimmingly well. Uh, it's been great experiences where every staff member has gone and done circulation cross-training at another branch or department. The goal next year is to open that up to some other non-circulation departments. Review of um, the employee assessment process. This is an ongoing thing. Uh, we've been working 
we're talking about internally quite a bit. Uh, there's been some um, turnover at the city of Charlottesville in the HR department, but they've got a, a stable situation now with a new director. I think now's an appropriate time to talk to them about what they're currently using, especially as they start to implement their new salary scale. Uh, we wanna make sure we're lockstep with that. And then the last one is by the end of 24, our staffing should meet or exceed the EE standard of 0.5 full-time employees per thousand people. So I did some napkin math on that before we, we started today. That would be 117 full-time equivalents. And we currently, including our substitute hours, like the fully budgeted substitute hours, have 105. So about 12 40-hour positions under what the state at that time considered to be the, if you think about it in baseball terms, like triple E is the best, double E is the next best, E is, is the passing standard there. So we're at the passing standard and we're trying to get to the middle of the pack there. Hey, David, you yeah. mentioned in, I guess, another that, that that, is that no longer the standard or was another objective no longer? The state no longer, uh, so both of those, anything that references an E, 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 or E, E, E standard uh, has been changed. They removed the data thresholds from it, and they use broader language now, Kayla. It's in the um, strategies for uh, planning excellence, I think, is the document that the state puts out. It was It was revised after this plan was done, and they removed the exact standards. Mm -hmm. JMRL kept them in our five-year plan because they were good goals for JMRL, but the state decided they didn't work. You know, what works for JMRL is not the same as what's going to work in Galax and, and in Fauquier. So they removed those across the board metrics, basically. Does that answer that? Yes, thank you. Okay, strengthen JMRL's collection. Um, Enhance and ensure stability for collection funding, including advocacy for state level support, local support, inspire private sources for gifts. So um, I considered calling this done, but it's really, I don't love this objective because it's, we need to do this every year, all the time. Uh, we've made great gains statewide in state aid, uh, which I think is another goal here as well. Um, and there's good budget news, hopefully uh, being discussed now in Richmond for state aid for next year. So uh, it would be all in all over $5 million in addition to state aid over the last two years, the, bi the biennium. So things are going well there. Also the uh, Friends of the Library Endowment Fund has discussed supporting the collection uh, annually with additional funding. Um, we have been able to do that tied in with construction projects. So for uh, Nelson, for Crozet, uh, there has been fundraising that the funds were held by the CACF, uh, the Friends Endowment there, and then funds were used to grow those collections, but we were looking for more annual support. They have agreed to do that. It's just coming up with the amounts that we need moving forward. So um, we don't want to rely entirely upon, and, and that would never work. We couldn't afford to rely entirely upon the Friends to, to uh, float the materials budget for JMRL, but certainly they can help support it while we continue to work on state aid advocacy. Okay, purchase materials in support of the Virginia Standard of Learning for all readers. It's done. Plan for concomitant changing collection needs. We mentioned the Nelson Expansion Project there and the new books. Develop a sustainable plan for offering circulating digital media such as film and music through the e-library. That's done um, largely through the, the uh, Canopy product that JMRL offers to the public now. Update and revise the collection management plan. I know that's an ongoing task, but I don't think there's been an official, like here's a date on it update uh, since this happened. Meredith Dickens, any thoughts on that? Uh, no, that's correct. Um, whatever changes we were gonna make or updates were we you know, shifted priorities during COVID. So we sort of, I, I <laughs> held off on codifying any changes in procedures or, or priorities we were making. Um, and so it remains an ongoing goal objective to, uh, to, to, to codify the, the updated revisions to the plan. I'm, I'm not expecting anything earth shaking there. Uh, you know, that we've got a really good plan that has worked really well. It's just making sure that it's up to date with current practices. 
Yeah, we have uh, we have the existing collection related policies that serve us very well in guiding our work, and the plan is mostly just a documentation of our workflows and priorities. Um, and so that's that's happening on a day to day. We just we I think I do still want to have it written down, um, but it's a continual revision. Okay. Um, using benchmarks from a long time ago now and collection data gathered ever since then, evaluate foreign languages and English as a second language learning materials available. So this is another ongoing objective uh, that you know our data, all of our data metrics from fiscal years. Uh, 20, 21, and 22 are skewed, and it's going to take a, a few years for us to figure out how skewed they are. Like, what is what is the new normal, right? What is the return to to uh, normal usage patterns there? Because things changed. So I, I imagine this is one that we'll want to pin and come up with some sort of new version of for the new plan. Evaluate current, I'm sorry, assess current interlibrary loan services, explore eliminating the fee, combining requests for materials purchase with those for materials lending. So this was the aforementioned UVA project there. And the last one was explore and evaluate alternative pricing and licensing models in the digital marketplace. Uh, for example, cost per use. So yes, we looked at this constantly, but the, the conclusion that I, and Meredith, don't let me speak for you, but the conclusion that I think that we reached was that, uh, that we were limited in the products that we could offer to the public here and that um, we, didn't, we weren't going to be able to build a new lending model for public libraries nationwide. Yeah, the, the nature or the... The reality is that the marketplace sets these pricing plans and we don't have any, like we just accept them. Um, but we do have alternatives, like for instance, this year in Canopy, we adopted a, a subscription model in addition to the pay per use model. So we are, it's a constant evaluation of what's out there and what we can utilize. Um, but I'm not sure having an objective is, makes sense because it's just a business decision day-to-day -day business yeah. decision and the 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 real changes here if they're going to happen are probably going to happen on a legislative level and i know that there are some states that are implementing laws that kind of govern how uh content is sold to public libraries on a digital level virginia had a bill that that um didn't make it through this discussion i'm not quite sure where it landed on that but at least at some level some members of the of the house of delegates are, are aware that this is a problem yeah, one one thing that would be interesting to look at is where the state library stands on this. They've sort of backed out of offering ebooks. Uh, you know, they sort of dropped their entire overdrive plan and have been other unlike other states that do have a state level sort of negotiation for right. consortia. Um, Virginia doesn't. It doesn't seem like. Um, but if there is anybody at the state library who's who's looking into it, that would be interesting. I, I don't think so. I think that that, um, so the decision to back, they were offering overdrive content for libraries that they, that needed support in beginning their own digital collections. And then they saw that as a removing of the scaffolding for that support. So I'm not aware of any discussions about that sort of negotiating leverage, although that would be fantastic. Okay, funding. Effort to increase state aid to 100% of the amount mandated by the state code. Still not there. Um, but if the money comes through this year, uh, we'll have made, I think, a 15% increase in the last five years there. So it was at under, under uh, it was around 50% for a really long time. And I think we're approaching 70%. Uh, Tony will know how bad it was, you know, 15 years ago. So great strides are being made, a lot of support at the state level for state aid for public libraries. Um, and uh, we work very closely with the legislative committee uh, at the Virginia Library Association that I'm a member of to kind of advocate for this annually. Every once in a while, trustees, I'll send you something that says, hey, can you sign this letter that's going out to your elected official uh, to ask for an increase here? Um, so we're never, I, I shouldn't say never, but I don't see a future where every year it's 100% funding here. So we're constantly going to be advocating for this, but there have been great strides made in the last five years. 
So this um, next one, back to Kayla's point about this funding, the funding standard defined by the Library of Virginia is no longer in place there. They no longer offer a metric to use there. Um, but uh, we can still highlight uh, services that can be provided with greater funding. We have made some strides with increases in funding uh, in, in our um, outlying jurisdictions. Uh, specifically, we we're able to get another position added in Nelson County, thanks to Susan's work there. Um, done some work in Louisa on the same front. Um, so a lot of that comes down to staff. You know, when we're talking about funding for library services, a lot of it is bodies to help people out. So this is an ongoing goal as well. Annually, we do utilize goals and objectives from jurisdictional strategic plans. When I send an email to each jurisdiction saying, here's our request for next year, I make sure to reference the plans that they have and how JMRL aligns with those. Number four there, we are currently exploring alternatives to the out of area fee that jurisdictions charge to non-residents. As a reminder, this is codified in our regional agreement, so it is not up to JMRL. The JMRL board has uh, on record expressed that they would like to see this go. They think it's a barrier to access. Uh, the review committee of the regional agreement is still meeting on, on a five-year schedule. It's mandated and uh, the process began in the fall largely to discuss this out of area fee. The first plan that JMRL put forth was to um, remove out of our area circulation from a calculation of regional costs, and it doesn't look like that one is going to work. Um, so we're, we're on to plans B and C here. So this is an ongoing project. I, I had moments of, of hope a month or two ago where I thought that there was a good chance that we would be able to remove the out of area fee. Now it's less certain. And again, it's not JMRL removing the out of area fee. It would be up to Charlottesville, Albemarle, Green, Louisa, and Nelson. Okay, the next one, develop a fundraising plan and annual calendar. Uh, this is a, a sp sporadic thing. Uh, we need to work closer with the friends on this. Individual objectives should include raising awareness for annual giving solicitation of major gifts, support for our materials budget, things like that. So I think we need to develop some promotional materials and then come up with a, a strategy long-term here. And AJ is working on number six, is restructure deposit transmittal forms and procedures to isolate revenue received exclusively from fines and run a fiscal analysis. So we the goal in here had been explore going fine free. And then we realized that we weren't collecting data in a way that was going to tell us exactly what that would mean. So uh, last year, this group presented to the full board a change to this objective number six to say, well, let's get these things cleaned up and then collect the data so that we can make a recommendation to the board. Okay, last one. You guys are doing great. Facilities. Work with Nelson County and implement an expansion of the Nelson Memorial Library. Um, done. This working group of trustees, staff, friends, community members, and Charlottesville and Albemarle staff to advocate for the renovation of the Central Library. It, it hasn't happened this way. This was the envisioned uh, plan here, and uh, it has instead been a lot of individual dealings and discussions with uh, elected officials and staff members from both Charlottesville and Albemarle. The building is co-owned by Charlottesville and Albemarle. Uh, I think we have more discussion between both bodies now uh, than we have had in many years about this project. Both groups of elected officials are aware of the needs here. The two jurisdictions are speaking to each other about it. Uh, the, the last we heard was from a Charlottesville budget report in which uh, City Manager Rogers said he spoke to County Administrator Richardson about this and that the county did not have it as a priority at the time, but they would review it. So that's where we, we are now. I, I do call this some progress. Uh, Tony wrote an impassioned letter to both bodies last fall that I think made a lot of sense. And uh, we will capitalize on this forward momentum, even if it doesn't make it into a capital improvement project in the next few months here. Inventory all signage. So this is a longstanding desire of staff here. We've got kind of um, signage grows organically around branches. You know, some of it comes, you know, when you're doing a building project, there might be signage that comes as part of that. Some of it comes as things pop up. 
Lord knows during COVID, we had a million different signs. Every two weeks, there was a different sign to come up to explain to people how they could access library services. So uh, we're looking to uh, have our PR specialists inventory the signage and come up with a plan to get it together. We have had uh, uh, staffing change there and um, uh, still getting up to speed on this one. Timeline to create a drive-through book return and pick up at Gordon Avenue uh, is done. This part, uh, the, the project's not ready, but the timeline is that it's beginning at the end of next month and should be done by summertime. We still need a parking study for each location, objective five. And we still need to work with the county on exploration and planning for a Southern urban library. Uh, so when I started in this position, that was a big conversation, whether it was gonna be building something new on county owned property on the southern urban ring of Charlottesville, so kind of the the mirror of north side or it was going to be potentially working with piedmont to have a joint use facility a public library combined with their um their community college library or renting space in one of the retail areas there uh as much as we did with north side to improve the demand so Constantly in communication with the county about this. I mean, they understand how much growth is happening down there. If you all have driven anywhere on the southern end of Charlottesville, you see the boom that's happening there. Uh, this is not in competition with the Scottsville Library at all. It's to serve the southern urban ring where all the housing is coming up. Ultimately, that's going to be the county, Albemarle County's decision on when that should happen. Their previous 20-year comprehensive plan included plans for a library on Pantops. Uh, so they have broadened that discussion to be kind of the broader bottom part of the Charlottesville Urban Ring. And the last one here it goes hand in hand with those strategic plans that each branch manager is working on. So it's services and facilities. Uh, and I think about it as like a little mini strategic plan for each branch. So things that wouldn't get encapsulated in this document we'll have on the staff end for here are the things, here are the, the services that we think we're gonna need to provide in the future for our communities. And then there's an appendix which nicely links back to each one year by year. Okay, that was a lot. Thank you all. <laughs> you got it done by 3.15, well done. Excellent. Excellent. What did the agenda say? 315. We're moving on to the All discussion. Right. Yeah, that's very well. Very good. Okay. Um, so if we're ready to move on there, then I, it is time to start thinking about the the um, new plan. And we've got approximately a year to come up with a draft to present to the board. I say, you know, it's February, so we've got until June, but you know, it's close enough. Time flies. Um I would I would like this group uh, with Meredith's approval um, to start getting together regularly. I I'm stealing from Haley Tompkins. Uh, what has been very successful for the staff training committee is to kind of have smaller subgroups that might work on one or two goals at a time. Like I already know we're talking about who's going to assign what to what here. That Kayla is going to be responsible for the goal on technology, right? So she can go back to the staff technology advisory committee and start coming up with some stuff to report back. Uh, so Meredith, what I was thinking maybe is, is we could uh, start to divide up into groups that would focus on one or more of those areas. And those groups could meet kind of on a one monthly schedule and then the full group could get back together on another monthly schedule for at least now. So that would be, it's February now, so that would mean little small groups meeting in March to do some discussion and some work, and then the big group getting back together in April. Does that make sense? Sure. And are okay? we sticking, we're sticking with six goals and generally the same categories or what do you? I think that that's, um, that's up to us. I think those have worked well for JMRL, but I don't, I don't wanna, we don't have to be in a box there. If there's something that we're missing or not thinking of. Um, one of the things that I can do is put together a review of peer library strategic plans to present to you all uh, the next time the full group gets together. Might be useful that maybe we'll start the full group again first and then break up into littler groups once we decide for sure, like here are the categories we wanna use. And the only other big thing that's hanging out there is how do we wanna go about engaging members of the public to seek feedback? 
you know, we want to hear from people about uh, what they're looking for from their library services in the next five year period. I know last time we did um, an in house survey, uh, we created it ourselves. Um, I would be willing to work with the Center for Nonprofit Excellence, which we're members of. I know that they work on some survey work. It does come with a fee, but I think we could probably swing it. Uh, Krista had mentioned um, another consultancy group that works with public libraries that Jamer has used in the past. The Ivy Group. The Ivy Group, right. Um, it depends on cost too. I mean, if it's more than our thresholds, then we would have to go out and bid for it. So I think we're looking for something that's reasonable because we don't have a separate budget for this. It would it would be something that either would come from leftover operational funds or we would ask the friends to help with. Um, are there uh, thoughts about those categories? Go ahead, Meredith and Haley. Yeah, the one thought I had is, and I'm, I am happy with the existing categories, um, but if we were thinking of shaking things up by changing, um, since we made the last plan, we adopted a new mission and value statements and the, that those values are like four different categories. They're not quite as concrete as facilities and services, um, but we could consider aligning sections of our objectives and goals with the, the, the values that we've identified, if it works out. I like that quite a bit. And I think we could use the six maybe to develop here are the things that we need and then figure out how to how to put those within the four value statements that we have. Because I agree, there's not one specifically about facilities, but there's a value about having a welcoming environment. You know, we could kind of- Right, up. if we take the value of equitable open access, that can include goals about facilities and about collections and about services, and but it just sort of conceptualizes things differently. I think, I think that's a great idea. Haley, you were going to say something? So I'm coming into this like never having been on this committee and not really having interacted with it a lot. Like I don't I don't think my, my biggest takeaway is that first the first goal, access and outreach, has so, so many things that I don't think we could possibly all work on at the same time. And that's why a lot of them are still yellow. But also, I don't think that the majority of staff interact with this or have any idea what's going into this. And to get some of the branch, like the full, like all the branches involved, you know, like like Susan's efforts on the literacy front are incredibly awesome. Like she's done such a good job. I don't think that, you know, there's been a concerted, like a, a, a talk system wide because I, I wasn't actually aware of a lot of those like like specific types of goals or like, you know, we all have like, um, you know, we all do work in schools, like all of our, you know, we all of our children's people go into schools and, and stuff, but I don't think that it's tailored to this at all. And so like, I don't know how much maybe the children's committee knows about a lot of these objectives that are specifically ch children's services related. And I that is is time too, Haley. Like Angela developed a lot of those in theory with the children's committee. Um, was she on this committee before? Yeah, we've had so much turnover though, and Megan likely should be on this committee. Yeah, had so much turnover during COVID since that time. But you've had staff that have been consistently on the children's committee during that time. So yeah. that's a valid that's a valid um, critique. Yeah. And then the other thing was in terms of staffing some sort of retention program because of the fact that I feel like a lot of our institutional knowledge is slipping away when people leave. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that creates a barrier to like getting some of these objectives done because when there's a lot of turnover, somebody has to learn a whole new thing and then they can't come into it. Like with our PR, especially, you know, how are we gonna accomplish anything if we keep losing the person that's working on a thing? Um, and then, you know, in Jennifer, Jennifer is just underwater because she's asked to do so many different things. I think she's good at it, but I think yeah. you might need an assistant <laughs> to get what she needs to get done done sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I think that that, that could align 
that could be an area that we would try to find some goals for. But this, what you're talking about, I think also goes in with what I started by saying is that like the specific, the specificity in the last goal is probably more than right. we're looking for. Cause really this is the board statement to the world of here's what we want JMRL to do. Not the specifics of like, oh, we want Nelson to have a book drop on the, on the South end. You know, Tony always jokes about how he got on the library board because he wanted the book drop. What was it, Tony? You wanted the book drop at Northside moved or? No, I just, I wanted a sign at Northside that said, please, we're here for next available clerk. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so like, those are the things that people tend to care about you know, the actual things rather than the big picture things, but this should be a big picture, like giving direction to staff on how to provide the best library service. So um, I'm shocked, Haley, that you hadn't already read this whole five-year plan multiple times uh, over the years, but um, we'll, we will let that pass for now. Uh, at the time, I uh, we did some kind of outreach to staff on like, here's here's what it is, here's what it's going to be. But I don't think we've had these like regular like this type of conversation with all staff about like here's what's in the plan and here's how here's how here's what we're asking you to do as an employee to carry this out and then here's how what's in here impacts what your work life is going to be like. So it sounds like you need a really splashy rollout when you get the next five year yeah. plan into place. That's um, great. <laughs> and as David, the chair of this committee, you're responsible. T-shirts. <laughs> David, David, one thing I wanted to mention was yeah. in a previous life, and I, I, I did this before, um, we did use the Ivy Group for, um, a, a, you know, basically a, a customer survey going forward with a five-year plan. I got to say anecdotally, and I, I may be misremembering that, I don't think we got a lot of value for the money. Um, it was it was fairly involved, fairly complex, um, and as I remember, costly. Um, and I don't remember that we got really any any you know input or um, insight that we didn't have before. Um, but that maybe had just been you know back then could have been the Ivy Group, the Center for Public Excellence. Is that what we're talking about? Nonprofit, nonprofit excellence. I think it might be worth a try. Um, you know, let's let's maybe give give somebody else a shot at this type of thing. So, well, I've surveyed customers before, and I think you know, I mean, we could do a homegrown one with just Survey Monkey. The question is, how do you get somebody to fill it out? So, yeah. you right. know, uh, and they're going to run onto the same problem, which is to say, if I'm coming to use the library as someone with a card, I don't necessarily have a device that will then, you know, scan something to do a survey. And why should I stay and do that? Right. You know, yeah. unless I'm really have a bone to pick and I want to sign that moved <laughs> like Tony um, and don't want to join the board to do it. So I think they're, they're all going to run into the same issue. The question is, is this something that we need to do to dot an I and, and, and cross a T or is it something that we really passionately think we want to gather info from the public? And those are sort of two separate boxes in my mind. So yeah. that would just be a, a question of where are we at the end of this and, and how much yeah. do we feel that we need to talk to the public and, or how much do we feel like staff is talking to the public? I, mean, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would much Thank rather you. be you hear, hear from staff actually than members members of the public um i'm a you know i'm a cynic about surveys in general it's my that's don't close your ears um but, <laughs> you know i i'm a cynic about how surveys are, are loaded by the people who want to respond type of thing you know you get the input that they they want to give whereas the staff have to live with this thing for five years they've got to you know they've got to do this going forward and they've got to be able to uh, not sell it to the public, but they've got to be able to stand up in front of the public all the time and say, you know, we really feel that we need to do X, Y, and Z, and it's in our five-year plan and it's important to us. And it's just, you know, the the old also, the old cynic speaking here. Yeah. Also, I feel like um, just what sort of Meredith was talking about is if we align it with our values, then we're not saying we want the public to respond to where we are right now. We're saying we want to go in this direction. And it's really hard for the public to say, oh yeah, that direction, because they haven't been there yet. So the, right. so I think it's a little bit of a challenge too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I do feel I though that sometimes uh, sometimes yeah, when I, I, I get a, get these um, these surveys, I was like, yes, yes. 
yes, 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 just to get it out of my way. And I think uh, a lot of the patrons will probably be doing the same thing. Uh, you know, just, okay, I'll just check this off and then they won't bother me anymore or something like that. So I don't know if you get a true, yeah, unless unless they're really, really something that, that bugged them, you know. Yeah, and then you, you also have the other issue, Alita, which is to say, you come into the library, hopefully you are interacting with the patron, and hopefully the library is giving you something because you're, you're there, right? The people that, do you want to hear from the people that never come to the library? Well, how would we actually survey them? You know, unless you say, hey, um, city of Charlottesville, when you send out the power bill, you know, could you include something? And then we'd have to do it with all of the counties, and I don't know if they all reach out in the same way to to their constituents because I actually just live in the city so I don't know but then then there's a question of are then we're using all the, those partners to gather that data about do you use a library or not but then what are we going to do with that I mean you probably David already know how many people are using the library so yeah I mean we've got data on that but this is the same conversation we have every five years is how do we get the feedback the users that aren't using the library because we're pretty well aware not you know not to generalize but the people that are using the library we get feedback from and we tailor services towards them it's the folks that aren't using the library that like how to figure out what their needs are that we're not meeting Chris I'm sorry you're trying to get Something. No, that's all right. I mean, that was part of it is we we can reach other people that are using the library through the patron newsletter, through the people that engage with us on social media. When we ask questions, we get a lot of feedback. We've been talking about this as relates to a new digital media lab, like what, what do people want? We don't want to tell them what they want. We need to find out what they're not what they want you know we, we we don't get to decide that but how do we reach the non-users um i wanted to give susan kudos because pretty much everything that, that had to do with nelson county got done so um good for <laughs> way to go susan i think it'd be helpful as what uh i believe haley and someone else said as we're losing staff members um you know knowing where we were and knowing what was done like how how did you do this in nelson county how did you get to the schools where do we start what were the steps in place what was the timeline so that we can pass that on i also made a long list for myself of things that i feel like i have responsibility for but we've had so much turnover which has been mentioned already that we have half of our staff including some of the people that are directly responsible for some of these things don't even know about them because they're just trying to get the day-to-day -day, um, things done. And this is more big picture, which they're having, they're not, they're not able to look at that right now because they're just working on getting the things done that they need to get done day-to-day. -day. So I do think either in our branch training days or in our all staff training days, we need to focus on some of these pieces so that everybody knows. And I agree with what Tony's saying is that our staff are probably the most important um, people to play a role in this and to say, yes, this sounds good. No, this seems like it's a waste of time. Uh, I think that's about it. But I did make a long list for myself of things well, like, oh yeah, I, I could be. I really feel like, you know, not to blame everything on COVID, but and uh, in, in yeah. some sense, like, like our that's part of the turnover too. a different place now than it was when this plan was put together. And we have accomplished a lot of things on here and the things that are yellow on there, there's a lot of work that has happened to move those forward and, and maybe not enough to say, yes, we're done with that. But, um, you know, I, I feel like what you're talking about, Krista, the like just trying to maintain library services, like being in kind of survival mode, especially in the, the heart of COVID there, where it was like, just how are we gonna provide library service to people? really made it like a, a, a lean, mean, feral <laughs> library staff, right? Where it was like focusing on providing core services to people uh, that that not to say we're, we're done, you know, we've got a year left in this current plan, but really I'm looking at a new plan as a way to bridge that gap there and to, to you know, we've got new faces. Our community doesn't look the same as it does five years right. ago. Across. But I was thinking at what the ESL or the one that had to do with our community, you know, we had the Afghani group here in the library saying that there is now a significant Afghani community in Charlottesville, and that happened over the last five years, yeah. you know, and, and getting that information to figure that out. Um, I do feel like the, the turnover issue kind of, again, just trying to keep our heads above water. When we're constantly hiring people and we're short staffed, it's really hard to look at the the big picture when we're just trying to get the desk covered in various locations, which has been going on, it feels like for 
the last year um, in some places. So I know that's an excuse and we still have to keep moving forward, but I like what, what Haley said of something in terms of retention and, and planning for vacancies or planning for you know loss of institutional knowledge. I feel like retention needs to be one of our goals, David, I don't know. But it kind of ties into that compensation study and some of the other mm -hmm. things that were mentioned um, in terms of staffing. So the training, all those things. Um, I also had a thought. So I feel like instead of reaching out to the general public, which especially people who are non-users don't generally know what we do, so they wouldn't know how to help us plan for our future um, because they might not know how that library can help them in the first place. I think reaching out to community partners and like heads of community partners, like in the areas would really help us like nail down the the people that we're not reaching and like how, I mean, so if we were to survey anyone, I don't think it needs to be as wide of a net as like the general, all of the general public and the people who are already using our, our buildings as much as it would be to other like community partners or people who aren't like That's head community groups that like, is that what you're talking about? I wasn't part of the group that worked on, Krista, maybe you were, that worked on the uh, strategic plan that did use the Ivy group, but that's part of what they they did. They identified community leaders in each of our five jurisdictions, and they focused some of the, the surveying on them. So it would be like, you know, the the head of the Historical Society in Louisa and things like that, and or, or various uh, homeowners associations or whatever it might be. So it wasn't, they did a broad thing, but they also did a very focused thing. I think that's, Tony, maybe what you're referring to is didn't, didn't give back all this, you know, new data. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very good, very good point, though, that, you know, patrons may not be aware of the kinds of things that libraries can offer um, and asking them, what, what should we do? They might go, well, keep on doing what you're doing because it's good. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I'll say like people that I talk to at the desk, you know, they'll say, oh, it must be so nice to just get to sit around and read all the time. And mm -hmm. so like they have no idea of the other kinds of stuff that librarians do on a regular basis. And some of them do, some of them see the other stuff that we do. And then you get people who don't use the library that, um, you know, they're just like, aren't libraries dead? Like who uses the library anymore? And that's people who still, there's people who still think that. So like, it's because they don't know what we do. So they, I don't think they'd be the best to also inform what, you know, I mean, they, they could be potentially, they may have ideas, but if they think that libraries are dead, then maybe they're not the people <laughs> that we want helping plan our future either. So I think Susan, Susan's been trying to squeeze something I, in. I think, COVID has caused us to change direction. I think that there, there are four things I wrote down. Um, because of the retention of staff, we've got to focus our direction on how we keep them. Um, we've got to refocus our programs. We can't rely completely on in-person programming. Uh, we've got to also get out and away from the library to be able to involve those people that we don't see. And our, our digital service growth is showing what COVID has done for us, that digital services is going to be a branch in its of itself. So we've changed our focus over the last few years because of COVID. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to trustees and to parole, uh, I mentioned yesterday to the JMRL managers that Meredith and I are expecting that this fiscal year will be the first year that digital checkouts will outstrip any given branch. So Northside has, you know, long been the standard bearer for really getting the most materials checked out, but this year we're expecting digital content to be the top. Go ahead, Meredith. Yeah, no, I agree with, with everything. And I think I can sum this up is something that we've learned when we're talking about the technology plan, which, you know, is three years instead of five years because things change more frequently. And one thing we've learned looking back the last several years is we need to build in flexibility, is that five years from now, we cannot predict what our services, are, our needs are gonna be. And David's idea about the restructuring of the plan with sort of a broader, um, broader idea of like focused and then the individual things are more on staff, you know, staff objectives. I think that will help build in flexibility and we can reevaluate as we go forward, as long as we're, again, aligning with our values, we're, we're sticking to the spirit of the goals, even though the concrete objectives might change 
I like it. Now I will say that it is mandated by law that it is a five-year plan. Right. So as much as we'd like to, to be flexible there, it does have to be. Now it can be, we have this discussion too. It can be reviewed as much as we want. Yeah. And I think just in those five years, we can, we can work with it as much as we like. Yeah. And well, it's sort of acknowledging if we have something we're working towards, the way we get there might change, but we're still. You yeah. Know. That's that well said. Yeah. I think that's, that's what I'd like to see. And sort of feeds into what Haley is saying, which is, I think the staff needs to be on board with what the tasks are. Like, so if we're setting the general objectives, the staff is saying, well, to get there, we need to do X, Y, Z, yeah. um, I think would be much more sensible and hopefully would get more buy-in from, from yeah, that's what she has to do the work. <laughs> exactly. And I think the one thing as a branch, when I was a branch manager, the one time I looked at the five-year plan was when we were trying to justify our budget requests, right? And so that's how the staff can use this plan to say, listen, I want to do this thing, or I need these resources, and here's why I need them, because it's in the plan. So whatever we can give to staff to, to get them what they need to, to accomplish these goals, put that in the plan. I think, too, if we each have branch plans, they should incorporate all of the things that are branch specific that, that need to go into that. So like, in my branch plan, when I was putting that together, I didn't put things like make it a goal to get to what is it, all the fourth graders, like make sure that they all have. I mean, I think we go to other, I don't know, I feel like we go to kindergarten and first grade and we do a lot of card pushes there. But like, um, you know, like not, I wasn't tying that towards an objective in this. So probably our individual branch plans need to address some of the things that. Are going to need to be accomplished region wide too. That's a good point. The goal there, I think, at the time, five years, four years ago, was to develop a system where kids, when they enroll in school, automatically get public library cards. And the closest that we've got is what Susan is doing, but it's still Susan and her staff create it. You know, like it's going to have to be. It's not an automatic thing, right? It's going to be a lot of manual <laughs> labor uh, to get that done. Um, so I still think that's a worthwhile objective, not goal. Um, this is great. I just love working with such smart people. It's fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so Meredith Cole, our, our fearless <laughs> leader here. She's like, what have I? What did I agree to? <laughs> this will be fun. So um, are we not quite ready then to divide into groups, David? Is that what you're thinking? Um, I don't know. What do people think? Like maybe one more big let's talk and I can come, I can bring some other example plans to you all. Uh, I can do a little digging about ways in the past that we have uh, engaged with the public. Like maybe here's what we did every five-year plan. Uh, and then we could all talk about that once more as a group and then maybe divide up per those values, making sure that we know if it's a facilities thing, it should be in this value. Like of the of the previous six categories, we know which one is mapped to which value because I wouldn't want two groups to be working on the same thing. Um, how does that sound? So I'll do some homework. We meet one more time and discuss for an hour or two. We're, we are missing a committee member too. I want to make sure Latasha gets to get in on this because she's uh, the only Northside rep that's on the group here. Um, and then uh, and then we'll kind of split up and do, so that would be meeting in March, all of us, and then end of March, beginning of April, the little groups meeting, and then end of April, beginning of May, the full group getting back together. Mm -hmm. That sound okay? Yep. Do we want to try to pick a date now, Meredith, or do you want to look at our calendars and figure it out? How complicated is everyone's calendar? They get a little, <laughs> they get a little dicey. <laughs> we can we can figure that like, why don't you and I get together and see what works for you and then then um I and mean, it doesn't always have to be every single person although it is good and we could also I, I do think it's useful to get together sometimes this is easy for a first organizational meeting but I think getting everybody in a room sometimes makes it easier to instead of everybody mm -hmm. has to take a turn to say their thoughts we can just yell all over over top of each other <laughs> we should probably go to Nelson right as as Krista oh, mentioned, yeah. Yeah. you know, we've got two Nelson members here on the committee and, you know, you want to see how all those things got accomplished, we can go down and take a field trip. Prol, how does that sound? <laughs> um, 
All right. Well, I think then, so, so I'll do a little bit of homework and Meredith and I will work, Meredith Cole and I will work on a date to get everybody back together. And we will try to do that in person. Uh, maybe not in Nelson. We'll see what, what makes the most sense. And then after that, the plan will be kind of to split up into. Uh, and did you say our deadline was June? The board will need to vote on it by the end of June in 2024. Ah. So a year from June. But okay. we want to get it to them because they might have feedback or things that they want to want us to change. So we would want to get it to them by spring next year. So we have about okay. a year, about a year to write something. Okay. So we're still in the very early stages. Yeah. And because you said June and I started to get nervous. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like, how many meetings can we get in before June, David? <laughs> oh, oh, June 2024. Got it. I, I yeah. have a feeling that right uh, once a month will be fine through the summer and then as okay. we next fall and then everybody looks around and says, oh, wait, now it's only six months. Then we might have to. <laughs> no. have then to we panic. panic. Okay, got it. A production. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Well, um, well, I guess David will reach out with a date hopefully that works for most people's calendars and in March you said early March uh yeah let's do, okay. let's do March okay sounds great this is a fun process so uh for all of you who haven't been through the actual four years ago writing of it it really is a, a good chance to step back and and think about the big picture so thank you all for volunteering your time to to help out with this thank you all right all right and Here, that's it yeah. I propose that we adjourn. <laughs> Bang the gavel. 17 minutes. Woo. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you get Go 17 outside. minutes of your life back. It's yeah. such a beautiful day. <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. Take care.